Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the library. I want to thank you all for coming out today. I'm Troy Swanson, the library department chair. We're going to get started. Um, so today's event uh, looks at um, community health and risk management, and it's part of our one book, one college program on World War Z by Max Brooks. So yes, that's a zombie novel, but no, we're not talking about zombies today. Um, if you're into zombies and zombie stuff, on Thursday at 11 o'clock, we're having a panel discussion by our psych department about the psychology of zombies, which will be a lot of fun. Um, today, we're thinking about one of the key themes of the World War Z book, which is emergency preparedness. One of the things I love about that book is that it, it turns zombies into this worldwide pandemic um, that's done in a very, even though it's, it's still a horror kind of story, it actually takes the, the outbreak very seriously on what would happen, and it shows some of the, the problems and kind of this thought experiment with um, how prepared we are to handle these kind of outbreaks. Today, we're going to talk about the real world and not zombies, okay? So we're going to transition um, back to real life. So um, I'm excited to welcome Jeremy Hurst. Um, Jeremy is a friend of our faculty in college. Even though he's from DuPage County, we're still nice to him. Um, visiting Thank you. In. So yes, uh, Jeremy is the chief of, ch chief of risk and emergency management for the DuPage County Health Department. Make sure I got that right, um, which I think is an awesome sounding title. He'll tell us more about that. His educational background um, is kind of awesome and varied. He has an MBA from Aurora University. He has a master's in public um, master's in public health administration. Public health. Master's yes. in public health from Benedictine University. I can't read my own bad handwriting. Um, MS in Emergency Management from Capella University, and a Bachelor's of Arts um, in uh, Administration of Justice from Southern Illinois University. So I think this is um, his background I love because it's a great example of the different kinds of things um, that you would study that come together to do this kind of work. And I think it's um, sort of awesome. So with that, a uh, round of applause, and I'll turn it over to Jeremy. Welcome, and thank you. All right, thank you very much. Um, before I get started, can I see a show of hands of who's here for today's presentation? <laughs> Outstanding. Let's go ahead and have you guys move forward so that if you've got questions, we can go ahead and hear them. There we go. Those folks in the back, you, you don't want to participate or engage it's up to you all right well thank you for those who have moved I promise I don't spit when I talk and if I do I allow you guys to come up here afterwards and, and smack me for it just real quick one of the first things I do every day when I walk into my office is try to motivate not only my team but personnel within the health department and one of the things I do is I start off by saying it's a great day for public health because every day we can do something that will advance our profession and make it better for tomorrow. Because what we did yesterday is not good enough. And so with that, it's a great day to be here at Moraine Valley. Just real quick, some of the things I want to discuss here in the next uh, 45 minutes or so is an introduction, a little bit more about myself, uh, public health preparedness description, kind of what is it that I do in my office and how it's integrated into uh, the DuPage County Health Department, uh, the role, a brief history, public health emergency preparedness, uh, the capabilities in which the government requires us to be accountable for the grant monies that we are allocated on an annual basis, and then also what DuPage County Health Department has done here with Moraine Valley Community College students, and then we'll finalize it with a little bit of some uh, future ideologies and, and methodologies uh, for the future. So again, my name is Jeremy Hurst. I'm the Chief of Risk and Emergency Management with DuPage County Health Department. Uh, my education uh, you know, is varied, but where I think I fit into this audience here is that I think of myself as a scholar practitioner. I like to read a lot. I like to try to figure out more of things I don't know and where that fits into, quote, that real world application. Um, I'm a Ranger Qualified Scout Sniper, or I was a Ranger Qualified Scout Sniper in the 82nd Airborne. So those of you wanting to go into mili or the, the military or even uh, policing, that's kind of where I thought I was when I was your age. Um, I was in Operation Enduring Freedom Afghanistan. And then from there, I've got experience in crisis management. I was on a response effort with security after Hurricane Ike, and our client was DuPont. Who's heard of DuPont? 
paint. Anybody like uh, NASCAR? They've got a big, uh, they spent a lot of money on, on NASCAR efforts. Uh, the, the point of that is there's a lot of you know, money in the industry of, of business and that also correlates. Some of you are nursing students or in the nursing program. So we'll talk a little bit about uh, the private sector as well. And uh, who remembers the NATO G8 summit here a few years ago? All right, I was a part of a security team downtown Chicago where I was in, quote, that green zone where we did a lot of uh, security planning and contingency planning in the event of disaster and emergencies down there. And then it brings me to current time with my public health preparedness planning. We do everything from continuity of operational planning, pandemic influenza planning, planning for disasters such as tornadoes, floods, the like, and then also more of that community planning of, of how do we integrate the private sector of business with governmental issues. Any questions this far? So real quick, what is public health preparedness? It's the achievement of building community resilience through fundamental principles and services in context of emergency management. Wow, that's a textbook definition, right? Who wants to kind of take a dive at what that really means? Michelle? Sounds good. So whether we're in that private sector setting or we're in the government, emergency management principles are just something that, it, it's, it's how do we manage a certain situation? In business, management by objectives. The, the Peter Drucker of, of Harvard Business uh, has come out with different types of methodologies for that management by objectives. In emergencies, it's just another tool in a toolbox of helping you streamline inefficiencies so that during disruption or that emergency disaster, we can systematically address the situation. So again, from a private sector standpoint or uh, the public, we want to start off with prevention and mitigation. There's different um, methodology we, methodologies we can utilize to look at potential risks. But there's also those risks that are unknown to us that we need to think about in our planning efforts. And that comes into preparedness, response, and recovery. In the terms of emergency management, we utilize the concept of all hazards for our planning initiatives. All hazards just means that we're not trying to plan for one situation, a flood. Because the way we respond to a flood is exactly the same way we respond to an epidemic, a pandemic. Whether that pandemic is influenza or heroin overdose like we're experiencing uh, now in DuPage County. The response is the same. And so when we think about all hazards and the way we move our planning efforts is exactly the same way. So that when we get like-minded individuals together, even though their disciplines are different, we can still hit the ground running. And so that's the importance of having a management style that fits across multiple disciplines. So whether you're in a hospital setting or you're in a policing agency or you're in fire, EMS, or, or the like, we can still come together and accomplish our mission. The preparedness cycle is much more of a quote, like a project management. How many people are, are business majors in here? One in the back, okay. So when we start looking at the preparedness cycle, project management, we look at our plan. And from there, what is it that we want to do? Okay, we develop that charter. We start to look at what is it that we want to accomplish in our planning efforts. From there, we, we identify that group. Who's going to be a part of this planning group? Who is it that we want to pull together and to utilize that human capital? Everything that's, that's right up here. Who is it that we want to bring in to help us solidify plans so that they work? And then there we start to you know, develop those, those plans. But the plans are only as good as the training and education that goes along with it. So those that are here are in college because you're trying to get some sort of uh, knowledge so it can be transferred to the working capitalistic society in which we live. With that, we do the training and we, we validate that training through uh, exercising. Through the exercise, we start to identify gaps that were wrong with the plan. It's kind of like here in school when 
you read about a certain topic and you've got to go write or you've got to take a test. We're validating that the information you learned is now articulated through your individualized efforts. Does that make sense? And then we do an evaluation improvement planning from there. So if we identified a gap or the instructor sees that there's a deficiency in the knowledge, then we can go ahead and identify remedies so that we can move forward with the progress. And we start it all over again. So the first day you sit in class, you get that, that syllabus. You go through the syllabus, and by the end of the, the course, you're doing a critique on not only the class, but also on the teacher. So it's a continuous cycle. We do that same thing at DuPage County Health Department in the Office of Risk and Emergency Management. And it's my job to make sure that we're constantly evolving, making things better. Hence, it's a great day to be in public health, or it's a great day to be here at Moraine Valley. Basically, the role of, of public health preparedness is to save lives and safeguard communities from public health threats. That's what the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention put on their website so that it's known to every public health entity in the United States of America because they are the ones that ultimately give us our money and hold us accountable for that money so that we can continue moving forward. So some of the things that, that we look at in public health preparedness is that epidemiological surveillance. What is epidemiology? Anybody know? What's that? Yes. So when we start looking at disease, we look at, at uh, influenzas or uh, tuberculosis. We've got a, a unit within the health department that tracks it. You know, there, there's um, trends that we, we monitor, whether it's here in the United States, in Illinois, or if it's abroad, Europe. Asia, Africa, South America, so that we can be better prepared and understand what those contemporary threats are or the risks. Sometimes risks can't always quantify. Anybody quantitative, quantify? That we put numbers to it, right? So not everything is as easily as saying 32% because sometimes you just can't take measures and quantify them. So they've got to be more qualitative. It's more quality. So when we look at the quality of life, or it's hard to say the quantity of life, correct? Does that make sense? Okay. So our office looks at different ways of taking qualitative information and quantifying it so that we can, we can move forward with a performance management uh, objective. And all that means is that we try to look at ways of improving our standards of public health preparedness. With the epidemiological surveillance, that's only one component. We move also into bioterrorism. Bioterrorism can be a plethora of different things. It could be the contamination of our corn supply that is traveling up and down the Mississippi River on barge systems. We also look at chemical emergencies. Who's familiar with Exelon? Can you tell me what Exelon is? Nuclear power generation, exactly. And so that kind of goes into the radiological emergencies. There's different components going back to even when I said we worked, or I worked with DuPont. During Hurricane Ike, a lot of those manufacturing facilities were damaged. So what is then that threat on the environment of those different chemicals? We also use Ex uh, Exelon. What are the threats from a potential disruption of a nuclear power plant here in Illinois that's only 50, 60 miles to the southwest of us? Depending upon the wind, that could have traumatic issues here uh, in the Chicagoland region. And so we try to look at a lot of different things from not only that disease standpoint, but also contemporary environments where uh, businesses are involved. But we've also got natural disasters. Here in a few weeks, we're going to start seeing uh, an influx of, of rain coming, right? We all know that spring uh, here in the Midwest brings rainfall. What does that do? It brings floods. Um, anybody impacted by the floods from last year in the audience? Pretty uh, devastating, right? Twice. Twice. With that devastation comes money. Okay, who's then liable for the damage? Is it the government? Is it you as, as homeowners? Is it private sector businesses? A lot of those policies are started and discussed at that local level. In my shop, in, in the Office of Risk and Emergency Management. Where do we drive some of the things? Where do we, where, who do we go and talk to? How do we mitigate, how do we prevent, kind of going back to that preparedness cycle, right? Back to the hospitals, 
if there was an event that caused mass casualties. Who remembers 9-11? Quite a few of us. Mass casualties. There's going to be an influx of personnel hitting the hospital emergency uh, departments and other types of, of medical facilities. Not everybody that goes into that emergency department is necessarily injured. We've got, what we, or in our industry, there's the worried well. They're just wondering, where is my loved one? Or am I impacted by this? I want to make sure that I'm okay. So there's got to be thoughts that go into that so that we can keep the injured going to the emergency department so that we can continuously uh, evolve and be able to help individuals who are injured, but then also those individuals who are not injured, getting them the information they're looking for. Does that make sense? So just kind of a brief history. We just talked about uh, the, the terrorist attacks, whether it was in New York or the Pentagon. Uh, there was a lot of scare. There was a lot of fear that was you know, thrown into U.S. society and amongst you know, the, the global environment as well. But one of the big things and weaknesses we try to identify for that continued effort uh, is that, that project management cycle. And some of the issues that were found from those terrorist attacks were communication failures. How do police departments talk to one another? How does the police department talk with hospitals? Or how do the hospitals talk with fire, long-term care facilities, private business, the community, you? How is it that the government's going to communicate with you about an issue that happened? The inability for information sharing. If there was something that went on right now, most of you'd pull out your cell phone, I would, and start looking at what's being tweeted, what's being put on Facebook. That's really dry, that social media drives the message. But as a government entity, we need to be ahead of that power curve, or at least be able to start looking at discussions that are in the private sector or amongst society to try to divert them from uh, negative information or just rumor control. It's not, I'm not saying that we can do the rumor control, but what I'm saying is that there's got to be a methodology in place so we can address it at the time and event. The lack of unified command. Has anybody in here taken the incident command system course here at Marine Valley? One person in the back? The incident command structure is a part of that emergency management uh, philosophy I was just talking to you about. It's a way that the government can control situations. Just real quick, the incident command system uh, stemmed from personnel that were in the Vietnam War that came back and were working wildfires in the West. And what they realized, the different wildfire battalions couldn't talk to one another about the advancement of those fires. So they, they, uh, they came up with the incident command system to help streamline some of those efficiencies. Who remembers the anthrax contaminated letters in 2001? A few. Anthrax is a huge scare. Um, it comes in different forms of color. Specifically, these letters were uh, mailed to approximately 17 people that were intercepted. Five did die. Uh, but it looked like uh, uh, dog food pedigree that was kind of crushed up, so it was brown. Other forms come more in like white substances, kind of like uh, um, other issues that actually happened in, in DuPage County, um, but more so for these anthrax contaminated letters for the Centers, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC, this is where a lot of our money is generated to build our plans that stemmed from the anthrax contaminated letters. What came of that immediately following the Bioterrorism Act of 2002? There's essentially five titles. You guys are all competent. You can read. I'll, I'll leave that up to you. But essentially, this was where the government put money forth so that we could start addressing issues like terrorism, whether it was at the 9-11 uh, or issues such as the, the contaminated anthrax letters. There was also the Public Health Emergency Preparedness Cooperative Agreements. And this is where the CDC granted $9 billion to start with uh, identifying units like mine. My unit at the health department, as I said, the Office of Risk and Emergency Management, is 100% grant funded. If those monies dried up tomorrow, I wouldn't have a job. So the importance of the money for developing these different types of plans are really at the, the, uh, the policy level of the United States government. Run through a little bit more, 2003, 
Uh, SARS. Does anybody remember SARS? SARS was, was another big one. Uh, people remember on, on the news wearing masks. It's a communicable disease. Uh, they're still monitoring different levels of SARS uh, at the CDC through the epidemiological surveillance. The avian flu, anybody remember the avian flu? Similar, it's, uh, you know, we're, we're monitoring it at our epidemiologic uh, department, at the health department as well. Just want to point out too, uh, the hurricanes, tularemia, the monkeypox, during those two years were also significant impacts in just the Chicagoland region. Presidential inauguration. When we think about Obama being elected here just a few years ago and came back to Chicago. The amount of preparedness efforts and planning that goes into that is extreme. And most people don't think of public health as an integral portion or part of that planning process. And so really, from even a healthcare standpoint, there's a lot of different areas you can go into that's not just um, nursing, but it's an administrative role that nursing is in integral to as well. Who remembers H9 or yeah, H, H1N1? 2009, just a few years ago. I had just gotten back from security uh, with, uh, with a contract vendor and started to understand a little bit more about public health, and that's when I started getting involved. The majority of the evidence-based research that drives what we do is from H1N1. It's now four or five years later. And so we're still using that research to demonstrate that program efficacy, meaning that it worked during H1N1, so therefore the validity means that it would work today. It's not necessarily the case because there's different capabilities that we had then and different capacity structures. And so that's kind of what I want to talk about next. There's 15 core capabilities that public health preparedness drives on. And one of those that is the most overarching is community preparedness. Part of community preparedness is what I'm doing today. I'm coming out and I'm talking about what it is my shop does. How is it that we build plans that will help us mitigate and prevent risks for tomorrow, but then also respond and recover from specific uh, incidents? That recovery or community recovery is extremely vital because during an event, we can respond. But depending upon how well that prevention and preparedness was leading up to the, the response needed will depend upon how well you recover. And it gets further into emergency operations. How do you coordinate during emergencies? Those discussions have to be brought up well in advance before any kind of emergency occurs. Information public or emergency public information and warning. How are we getting information to you, citizens, community members? Is that information relevant to you and your families. If we don't do a good job at doing that, we just lost credibility. If we lose credibility, the entire community goes into its own type of crisis. And so it's imperative that when we get you information that it makes sense. How many people live in Chicago? How many people live in Palo Heights? Or Palo Hills, I'm sorry. Okay, and then I live in the DuPage County region. There's different news casts within those geographic areas. We need to make sure that what Chicago is putting out is the same thing we're putting out in DuPage County. If there's slight differences, we need to be able to articulate what those differences are. So there's a lot of you know, cross collaboration uh, amongst jurisdictions, meaning different boundaries. Fatality management, information sharing, mass care. Kind of talked about that before. In the event of a train derailment in the middle of a town and there's you know, mass casually to, you know, those citizens, what's the plan for addressing that? How are we going to respond, but then also recover? We've also got to think about the environment. How is the environment impacted? And so there's, there's a lot of uh, intricacies that are uh, associated with emergencies and disasters. Some of our partners, Naperville Municipality. So in Cook County, you've got a public health department and they work with the different municipalities for their planning efforts. Private business. In DuPage County, we've got Exelon headquarters and McDonald's. We also work with non-governmental uh, agencies such as the Salvation Army and the American Red Cross. Some more of those capabilities, medical countermeasures dispensing. And I'll get into that where 
Moraine Valley Community College members have kind of helped us out with some of our training initiatives, but medical countermeasures dispensing. In the event of a bioterrorism event where we have to get out oral medications, we rely heavily on volunteers. In DuPage County Health Department, we've got 600 employees. We've got over, or close to a million residents in the county. So not everybody in the health department can effectively help us in that dispensing operation. Therefore, we've got to reach out and try to build capacity. So when we think about the capability meaning, we've got to dispense medications. Do we have the capacity to support that operation? And so those are some of the uh, planning initiatives that we look at. We get into the medical material management and distribution. How are we receiving medications or the medical materials? And then how are we getting it to our point of dispensing where we can actually reach to the community? There's a large logistical coordination component and then there's a large human asset component that helps us deliver and execute the mission. Medical surge, going right over to the hospitals. How do we know when they've reached their bed capacity? If they're, if they're being surged, how do we put the hospital on bypass so that we can start sending people somewhere else? What if the disaster breaks you know, a jurisdictional line and now there's, there's issues where we need to reach on both sides of that disaster from other jurisdictions? There's a lot of thought that kind of, that, there's a lot of thought that goes into the planning and it's needed so that we can have an efficient process to address emergency and disastrous situations. Moves into non-pharmaceutical interventions. These are just other interventions that don't necessarily require uh, prophylaxis or uh, injections of, of vaccines. Isolation and quarantine is a huge issue here in Illinois because as soon as you take somebody out of mainstream society and you put them into an isolation quarantine issue, you've now stripped them from their civil liberties. What does that mean? Sure, I can go to the state's attorney in DuPage County and get an isolation quarantine for whatever issue may rise. But there's nothing in the law that says how we actually monitor these people. Where do we put them? How do we feed them? And so these are some of the contemporary issues that we see that we need further clarification on at the state level and then also at the federal level. Moving forward, the public health laboratory testing. There's really only two, two major labs in Illinois, Chicago and Springfield. So if there's an issue in southern Illinois, they're sending their specimens up to the lab in Springfield. And here in the Chicagoland area, we may be sending it to Chicago. Well, what happens when that lab starts to see the influx of issues? How do they then control it? And so when we look at the state for further clarification, we're looking for methodologies to build in addition to uh, what's already there. So what's our contingency? Does that make sense? We kind of talked about public health surveillance and epidemiological intervention or investigations. If there was a foodborne illness that you know, outbroke here in Moraine Valley at the, uh, at the cafeteria, there's methodologies that are in place so we can identify well, what food item was it that got people sick? And so that investigation is very important as well. Uh, who's familiar with botulism? Anybody do canning in here? Or parents do canning? A few. Botulism, in, in our eyes, one case, boom, sends it right to the, the top as a priority for potential bioterrorism. But it's common in, in the canning industry where it's an important issue and people can get extremely sick. And so just, uh, just to highlight that in the event of something we do in our recreational time or our primary means of you know, living can really throw off what it is that we look at as potential terrorism. Responder safety and health. Whether you're a first responder in the sense of police and fire, we look at ourselves as a first responder in the sense of active shooters. I'm sure everybody in here is uh, familiar with active shooter that uh, Chief O'Connor uh, sponsors here at, at the Moraine Valley Community College. Yes, no? Has anybody heard about active shooter exercises in the community? One of the things that the health department has done is developed trauma disaster teams because people that are part of traumatic events 
need psychological assessments because there's the, the way that you and I deal with emergencies and disasters is different amongst us all. And so we've got trained uh, clinicians who are able to respond during those type of events. And those are first responders. Well, what is required of us, an agency, to ensure their safety from the point that they're gathered at the health department, transported to a site, and then delivering their, their expertise? There's a lot of thought that goes into that. And as I mentioned, volunteer management. How is it that we recruit volunteers like yourselves or clinicians to assist with emergency situations and then keep them involved? It's one thing to just have this master roster of individuals to say they'll want to volunteer. But if we don't engage those volunteers, they're not going to be around very long. And so that's some of the, the, the different initiatives that we try to think about. How can we utilize eager citizens to keep them engaged and utilize them during emergency situations. This is just a depiction right here of how we are developing coalitions. A coalition is just some, uh, a fancy term for how do we build those capacities with cap capabilities. So if a hospital has certain capabilities and the American Red Cross has certain capabilities, how can we bring those two together so that we can further develop both capabilities and capacity to assist during emergent situations. And it's the way the federal government wants us to streamline those allocated monies to, to ensure that this uh, occurs. So just real quick, one of the first things that we've got to do in any type of capability is assessments. When you've come to school or came here at Morning Valley Community College, did anybody have to take a, a math placement exam? right, or an English competency exam. You're going to see this type of stuff the rest of your lives. Before you can delve into any kind of situation, you need to do an assessment. What is it that we've got? What are we working with? From there, you can start to identify problems that you can address. Boyfriend, girlfriends, we go out on a date, right? We're already starting to assess the other individual. We're trying to see, is this somebody I like? Is this somebody I'd want to have another date with? Do I want to go get dinner? Do I want to go watch a movie? Right? So we do this same type of uh, ideology in the government day in, day out. We determine goals. Most of you are here trying to get an education because you've got a goal of aspiring to do something. Correct? Again, it goes back to what it is that we do every single day. And then you develop the plan. I'm going to go to Moraine Valley Community College. I'm going to get an associate's degree in nursing. I'm going to go to Moraine Valley Community College to get a degree in criminal justice. Okay, it's something you will continuously see well beyond today's information gathering. So, what has Moraine Valley Community College done in the past 12 to 18 months? Students like yourselves have come to DuPage County and helped out with mass dispensing operations where we've done what we call just-in-time training where we put you in the hot seat, that we put you in the dispensing table to help out with our, our plans because you get to help us identify what the gaps are within our planning so that we can go back that Monday morning and start to address it. When we think about throughput, logistics, and we have people go through a line and we're, we're uh, giving out medications or a vaccination, we, we measure those times and then we, we see, we take that, that information, that statistical analysis, and we look at what the plan says. And if there's, a, if there's an issue, there's a, a breakdown, then it's up to us to further enhance the plan. Last year, we worked with the University of Illinois Chicago in utilizing dentists as vaccinators during emergency situations. Now, in the event, nobody here goes to their dentist to get a vaccine, correct? But during an emergency situation, if the state of Illinois lifts that and says, we will allow dentists to give vaccines during those situations, we've just identified another capability that we didn't have before. Again, when we talk about hospital surge and the nursing uh, staff of the hospital being uh, impacted during a public health emergency, we need to think of other ways to still address and complete our mission. How many of you heard, think outside of the box? 
This is your think outside of the box in action. There's got to be ways for us to still complete our mission as efficiently and effectively as possible. And now we're going through the third phase of having um, this, this methodology published in a journal. And so it's, it's bona fide research. We used uh, an institution to help us go through the process of doing research to say we can not effectively do this methodology and here's the supporting evidence. We also had Moraine Valley Community College students at College of DuPage. Anybody familiar with College of DuPage? It's in DuPage County. Yeah. Hey. But we had students from Moraine come and help us out with some of those training needs as well. And then wrote papers on what their experiences were that we ultimately went through, vetted, and incorporated in further enha enhancement of our plans. So where's the future of public health leading us to? One of the, f <laughs> the biggest issues that I see, probably because it's part of my job, but is the funding. Since I started working at DuPage County Health Department, there's been a decrease in funding every single year. And if there's no public health emergency, we're not in the limelight of the government's eyes. I understand. They don't see it as an important need. But the same goes for you know, policing, fire, you know, healthcare organizations, whether they're for profit or not for profit, a lot of money is driven to support community needs through policy. And so maybe in time you'll find yourselves uh, writing those policies and looking at building a better efficient America. We also think about more with less ideology. Today I've got six individuals in my unit. Next year I may only have three. The expectations are still the same. I still need to complete the mission regardless of how many people I've got. So that out of the box thinking will become more critical as time goes on. Volunteer needs, there's always a need for volunteers. But if there's a decrease in staffing levels at the organization level, well, then that's just gonna increase the need for more volunteers, supply and demand. Impact of the highly improbable. It's great to sit down and think about the what ifs. But if we really don't start to identify risks that are highly probable, we're going to be caught in a disaster situation that will be extremely debilitating. In other words, if we don't start thinking much further into the future of what may potentially impact us, we may fall flat on our face. Collaboration among government and non-governmental entities. The world is changing with globalization becoming more and more eminent, we need to find ways of taking the private sector of business and government and integrating them where we can that's most possible. Who's familiar with the Obamacare Act? There is a major initiative and in transformation in the way we deliver health care today that is much different than it was yesterday. Those needs are coming together and it's up to people like you and myself of how it's going to end up because not all the answers are there. But delivering care to both citizens and members of uh, society is paramount. Evidence-based research. We do need clinicians working with research scientists, whether they're uh, in, in your basic sense of uh, social sciences or hard sciences. We need to be able to develop ways of conducting research that demonstrates it works in the real world. Because that gives us our, our fodder, our, our program efficacy to support initiatives. If we don't have those return on investments identified, we can't support ongoing programs. If we can't support those ongoing programs, there will be no jobs. And so everything's kind of uh, interrelated at some point. It's just how far do we want to get into looking at the discrepancies and how things fit together as a society. And with that becomes the performance management. What are we doing today that is going to increase, whether it's profitability or productivity, to help support? Or that program efficacy, meaning that it supports a program. And that comes with metrics. How are we going to measure both quality and the quantity of what it is that we do? And so with that, I welcome any questions you may have. 
I got to have something. I can't leave and tell my boss I spent, you know, two hours, you know, in South Cook County without a question. You've got a question. And I yeah. have a microphone so we can hear. Raise your hand. I'll bring it to you. <clears throat> How many is getting credit for being here today? Yes. Um, as far as mentioning that Moraine Valley students have volunteered um, in the past for those of uh, maybe looking to get a foot in the door in terms of public safety or just even in the field, how would they find out about future opportunities to volunteer? It's a little bit of a trip to come down to DuPage County, mm -hmm. but being that many of at least my students have found it very beneficial, um, how would they find out about that? How do they participate? Is there an opportunity potentially coming up to volunteer? That's a great question. How many are looking for jobs? How many plan on paying back student loans with money that they make from a job? Pretty much all of us, right? Networking is key. One of the things I didn't learn until getting you know, all those master's degrees and stuff was the importance of networking. The people you're in class with, the different organizations you belong to, will help you in that process. I can't you know, think of words that will really detail the importance of building your network. Um, to Michelle's question, you know, get involved with different organizations that, that you genuinely like. If you're interested in public health, find different organizations around the community to involve yourself with public health. If it's about policing, again, find something to get involved. There are different uh, academic um, committees and things here at, at Maureen Valley, but there's also different things at, at the community level that you can get involved in. How many like to play video games? They do it online, right? There, there's different, different types of networks that you can belong to. It takes your initiative to go out and find those different networks. So there's not a one size fits all. Um, to get involved with more of things that we've helped in the past is building public, public sector, private public sector partnerships where Michelle and I had met and she was interested in how can we get students involved with government training. Oh, we've got a great thing. We've got what we call the Medical Reserve Corps. The Medical Reserve Corps is a group of volunteers that we use during public health emergencies. And that's just, just one type of uh, partnership that, that we do at the health department to help us bring in people like yourselves, where if you're interested more in what it is we do, introduce yourself. Come talk to somebody. Don't be afraid. Because a job's not going to come to you and say, hey, by the way, I heard you like to do X, Y, Z. You want a $100,000 a year paying job? That just doesn't work that way. <laughs> does that answer your question, Michelle? It does. If they wanted to volunteer, is there a newsletter to sign up for or potentially continue to network with me for DuPage County opportunities? Or does your uh, office have any training coming up? One of the things I would advise is talk with your instructors. Get to know your instructors. Get to know your classmates. Find out what it is that people are doing. Uh, the Chicago Department of Public Health, we deal with on a weekly basis. Uh, Frankie Shipman, she's my counterpart there, they've got a medical reserve corps. The Department of Homeland Security of Cook County, they've also got a citizens corps, if that's the type of involvement you're looking for or, or would like to uh, volunteer. Uh, the Sheriff's Department, I'm sure they've got uh, different types of volunteer programs as well. It's really dependent upon what it is that you guys want to do and your tenacity or your perseverance to go find what it is that you want to do. Anything else? We have a question over here. Yes. You just mentioned earlier that one of the issues you're looking at right now is heroin overdose. Oh, yes. We'd love to hear just a little bit about what you're seeing or what your plans are. Absolutely. So DuPage County, uh, it's, it's been a few years. I can't think right off the top of my head when the epidemic occurs or occurred uh, but there's been an influx of heroin overdoses throughout the the county it's not centric to one municipality it's a community-wide problem yeah okay okay Naperville I remember in 2010 started to, or 2011 started to raise awareness in the Sun Times. Uh, I brought that to my instructor, or my, my boss at the time, and said, hey, from a public health emergency standpoint, 
this may not be a tornado, but it's an issue that needs to be addressed. What is it that we can do to address it? We started looking around the nation, noticed that Boston had a program, Philadelphia had a program. So we started looking at how can we benchmark off of established programs so that we don't hit the same pitfalls they may have. And we started to find uh, ways of addressing the epidemic. We got our public health nurses involved, and we found that instead of doing injectable uh, antidotes, there's a nasal spray, naloxone. And correct me if, if I pronounce any of these things wrong. Uh, but we, we started training first responders, uh, police officers. Paramedics carry the, the, uh, the naloxone kits on them. However, paramedics aren't always the first ones on scene. Sometimes those, those police officers uh, are the first on scene. Maybe the response time of the paramedic is 60 seconds, two minutes. Well, we need somebody there to reverse that uh, heroin overdose now. And so we thought of putting it on the streets with our first responders. Uh, the, pro, uh, the pilot started last September. We've got 32 municipalities in DuPage County and approximately three quarters, a little bit more, uh, have all trained their police officers on the street of administering naloxone to uh, heroin overdoses. We actually just had our first save uh, in six months this past weekend by the DuPage County Sheriff's Department. Uh, we've got another training next week for another uh, six municipalities for putting, or putting naloxone on the street and administering um, during the, these types of responses. Is there anything more specific? It's been, uh, it's been interesting, especially from a political climate standpoint. There's been some municipalities that say, whoa, we don't want anything to do with this. And then all of a sudden, one of those municipalities had an overdose issue where a cop was on site several minutes prior to a paramedic being there. And so now what? You knew about it beforehand. You could have prevented it. You could have mitigated the situation. It's, um, it's unfortunate. But that's kind of what drives policy and that political climate um, that's real. It, it's... It's just part of what we do every day. Any other questions? <clears throat> Has the Affordable Care Act affected your agency anyway? Or? Absolutely. There's uh, a lot of great things that DuPage County Health Department is doing to promote uh, integration of care. Uh, I'm actually a part of our quest for success. I'm the compliance officer for yeah. developing a much more better quality uh, agency when it comes to delivering some of our services uh, but then again we've got to go back and do an assessment of what it is that, that we do as a delivery um, to get into the finite details I'll be here another you know 10 hours uh, but we've got what they call access to page where we actively help the non-insured get insured and get them into our system so we can start giving them services our services are anywhere from you know immunizations to behavioral health support uh, dental and uh, other types of you know nutrition for new mothers and um, and newborns. It's a little bit outside of the scope of my office, but the more and more I'm getting integrated into uh, that transfer of care, it's how does my office still promote good health at at the that, uh, community level? Good question yes. back here. Um. Just to go back to the heroin one, yes. um, I actually had a really good friend of mine who, who was one of the people who passed away in November. And um, we have a lot of friends who are around the country, and they've all heard about the epidemic. So how does it travel? Like we were talking about like Facebook and Twitter and stuff like that. Do you guys ever get involved with that to try to pass the message on You know, with epidemics like that? You know, or is it just more social media? What we try to do is streamline our, our uh, efficiencies. And what I mean by that is we develop training programs. We've got a health promotions team that goes into our communities and talk about different issues. Everything from the current epidemic of heroin overdose to the importance of getting children vaccinated to washing hands and preventing the spread of disease. Um, there's, there's another epidemic that's on the rise, and it's, it's, it's facing us right now, but obesity. Childhood obesity is huge. What is childhood obesity going to do 30 years from now? What if we don't have the infrastructure to support 
overweight individuals and diabetes is therefore a debilitating factor on society. During uh, power disruption and there's no dialysis centers open and we don't hit the demand for that specialized population, what are we going to do? So to really answer your question, yes, we are out in the community. Uh, there's only so many hours in a day. There's, almost, there's only so much funding that we can um, you know, get out there and promote specific issues. But that's also where we use volunteers to help us support those different initiatives and in going out and spreading the word of what we're doing at the health department. Anything else? I'll, yes. uh, I'll throw in one question. You know, we have a panel discussion coming up on um, vaccines and um, the, the truth about vaccinations. Um, just last week, there was an article about a measles outbreak in New York City mm. and how serious that is and the risk. And I was wondering if you could comment on um, what is the level of risk right now for preventable diseases, and are we really seeing a resurgence in these diseases that we thought were gone, you know, two or three decades ago? And is that something you think about and are concerned about? Yes, it is something that we are concerned about. Um, the, 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 the right person to answer that question would be our epidemiologists. Uh, at my level of preparedness, we discuss different trends, uh, measles being one of them. The other one is the MERS coronavirus that's uh, in the Middle East. Uh, the, morbid or the mortality rate is close to 50%. That means that if you contract this communicable disease, you've got a 50, close to 50% chance of dying. And so when we start looking at those types of issues, that's kind of where we, we prioritize our efforts. Uh, the vaccination is a hot topic in public health. There's a lot of members of society in our communities that do not want to get vaccinated. But when we sit down as an agency and we think about who would be impacted within our jurisdiction is really how we prioritize those, those different initiatives. And our epidemiologists are the individuals who monitor those trends and work with uh, members of my team on how we're going to address those. So to get a more finite question, you and I can talk offline and we can talk about uh, what DuPage does to address that. Other questions? Did I bore anybody? Was it boring? <laughs> One of the things I like to do before I leave any type of um, you know, lecture or you know, speaking engagement is what would you like to hear if I were to speak again? Or are there different areas of improvement I can do um, to make this better? And trust me, it won't hurt my feelings. This is a school in, in, uh, environment. And what I like to do as far as coming to schools and universities to talk is that this is where I can engage you, the student, and to learn more from you. Because when I'm in a professional setting, I don't get that level of feedback. And so really, this is where I get to learn about ways I can improve through you and, and empowering your, uh, your ability to, to help me out. Anything? OK. Right, OK. All right. You know, the nurses, we like to be, act we like action. So <laughs> to hear about planning is, is like our first step, but then we want to hear that implementation piece. OK. But I do, I just want to thank you, because just, I, I know 10 minutes before you started is when you knew my class was here, and you certainly included nursing as part of what you did. I'm sure you did that because we were here, so I do appreciate that, and I think that's always a sign of an excellent speaker that they do work with the audience that shows up, so thank you for that. All right, you're welcome, thank you. All right, well, there are no other questions. I genuinely appreciate you guys coming today, whether you were forced to or not. <laughs> uh, if there are any other questions, uh, feel free. I'll, I'll be here you know, 15, 20 minutes to uh, answer anything individually, but um, Hey, have a safe day. How about a round of applause for Jeremy? Thank right. you, everybody. Thank you for coming. And thanks again uh, to Jeremy for his time and uh, today. So, thanks. Right. Thank you.